Hi folks, how's it going? You're very welcome to another Junior Cycle History Saturday session here at examrevision.ie. So in this lesson, we are going to look at Ireland and the European Union. So there are two learning outcomes from our Junior Cycle History strands we're going to cover. So the first one we're going to look at in this lesson is we must evaluate the role of a movement or organisation such as the European Union or United Nations in promoting international cooperation, justice and human rights. OK, and we are going to do the European Union. So that'll be the first half of the lesson. The second half of the lesson then is going to look at Ireland's place in Europe, how Ireland came to be part of the European Union and what the European Union has done for Ireland. So analyze the evolution and development of Ireland's links with Europe. OK, basically how, why we joined Europe, how we joined it and how we have benefited from European Union membership. So the European Union, we've probably all heard of it. We might have a vague idea as to what it is. OK, so that's very important. Before we go into anything, we must understand what, what are we talking about when we say European Union? Well, the EU is a unique economic and political union okay so think of the word union what does union mean well union is when a number of things i suppose are grouped together and work and cooperate together okay and that's what the countries in the european union do so currently the eu is made of 27 member states and again these are mainly in europe hence why it's called the european union they're basically all on the european landmass bar one or two like us for example we're we're not te technically not on the European landmass. Okay, so you can see some of the countries in front of you there: Ireland, Spain, Portugal, France, etc., Germany, Italy, Austria, Hungary. Now, depending on when you're watching this lesson, it is possible that the number of member states may have increased. But you know, it's not easy to join the European Union. It can be a long, drawn-out process, and it could take years to to gain entry to the European Union. You'll notice here. Britain, um, with Northern Ireland, obviously, is not no longer part of the European Union due to Brexit. OK, so because Britain left the European Union, they were in it, then they left, they decided to go out on their own. They are no longer on our EU map. So the European Union, so steps towards the European Union. So very important, we understand the origins of the European Union. Like, where did it come from? Why does it exist? What were the reasons for creating a, an economic and political union in Europe in the first place? Well, after World War II, we had something set up called the EEC. Now, the EEC is the European Union, okay? Back then, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, we referred to it as the EEC, which is the European Economic Community, and it was changed in the early 90s to the European Union. All right, it had a change of name. But the EEC and the EU are the exact same thing. And the EEC was established in 1957 following the Treaty of Rome. So the Treaty of Rome was a treaty and it was signed by a number of nations. These included France, West Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg and Italy. So this is kind of like a poster here um, following the Treaty of Rome of the original six member states. Now, why was it set up? Well, the year is 1957. You may, you may know about a pretty significant world event that occurred, the Second World War that occurred only uh, just over a decade earlier. So the Second World War was a big reason for the creation of the European Union. So the EU was set up to avoid another major world war. There was two world wars that were, you know, fighting kind of primarily based well, not you know, primarily based in Europe, I suppose, in World War One and World War Two. OK, so there's huge damage done to Europe in terms of people dying, damage to infrastructure, damage to the economy. All right. So, again, to avoid a major world war, to rebuild these damaged European economies and to prevent the rise of extreme political parties. So when we say extreme political parties, what are we on about there? Well, we're on about the likes of, you know, fascist parties, the Nazis, um, 
co extreme communist parties, for example, Joseph Stalin's communist Russia. Okay, so that was th those were some of the reasons why the EU was established. Now, all well and good establishing the EU, but what were their aims? Well, the initial aims of the EU were to promote economic growth. And again, the idea was this was done through cooperation. So these countries would cooperate with each other to improve their economies. This could be done by trading, okay, um, by the movement of people, goods, money. And again, it would, you know, it's kind of like by cooperating, we're stronger. The more, the merrier, okay? So the, the, a number of countries cooperated together with the same goal of improving their economies, okay? Um, second aim was to improve the standard of living in Europe. Again, Europe had been rocked by two major wars. There was a lot of people displaced from their homes, a lot of, lot of refugees, a lot of, you know, damage to the economy. So people were struggling. And this was, again, they wanted to improve the standard of living in Europe. Three, to bring member states closer together. Again, just to promote basic cooperation between member states. Again, this would prevent any wars breaking out. If you like, if you look at the member states here, for example, you've got France, Belgium, the Netherlands, who would have been, you know, on the Allied side, and then you, in World War Two, then you got, you know, Germany. Well, well, Germany was divided with West Germany and Italy, who were on the Axis side. Okay, so these are some of those countries were enemies in World War Two just over a decade ago, and now they are allies. Okay, so to bring these member states closer together again, to create unity, cooperation. Um, and to avoid any major global conflicts from, I suppose, kickstarting again. So, one of the main things we need to look at when it comes to the European Union is how does the European Union promote international cooperation? This is literally taken directly from our learning outcome from the junior cycle strands. Okay, well. The first way in which the EU promotes international cooperation is through something called the common market. Okay, now what's the common market, you might ask? Well, it's really simple. The EEC created a common market, and all this means is there are no trade barriers between member states. So basically, if you go buy something online, you may have noticed this, right? If you bought something online that was coming from the UK before Brexit, it would be there would be no tax on that. Okay, now because of Brexit, Britain is no longer in the EU. So if you try and buy something on Amazon or, or something online and it's coming from the UK, you'll have to pay a big tax on it. Okay, there's trade barriers there. So that's one of the consequences of Britain leaving the EU. So if you, one of the you know the one of the big benefits of being e, in the EU is the common market. There's no trade barriers, okay, no tariffs, no taxes, um, when it comes to buying or selling stuff overseas. So the common market meant that people, goods, services, and money can move freely between member states. So it's you know really really great way of promoting cooperation. This is a big step forward because at the time, like in this era, kind of the early to mid 20th century, it, c countries liked to, to, to see themselves as self-sufficient. They didn't, did not like to be seen like, you know, a sign of a strong nation was a nation that kind of could, could manage itself, look after its own affairs. Ireland would have been very guilty of this. We had a policy called protectionism where basically we didn't really trade with anyone else, maybe bar a bit with Britain. And we, we, we tried to make and produce everything in-house in Ireland. And the idea was that, oh, sure, we're going to, you know, this will create jobs in Ireland, etc. cetera. But, um, you know, it became very outdated and seen as not a good way of doing things. Okay. For example, Ireland in particular, like Ireland was a very rural agricultural society. And, you know, if we weren't bringing any, you know, smart people in or new new companies or businesses into Ireland, we are never going to develop, okay? So the common market was a big thing, and Ireland would eventually benefit from this when we would join the EU. A second way the EU promotes international cooperation is through the Common Agricultural Policy. Now, the Common Agricultural Policy, or CAP as it's known as, um, has been vital, particularly for Irish farmers. Okay, so the Common Agricultural Policy helps farmers improve productivity, 
and ensure a stable supply of food for member states. So the idea is that basically there's a constant and stable supply of food for European Union member states. Okay, and how do they do this? Well, if you're a farmer in a European country, you'll be entitled to receive grants and payments from the European Union to help invest in your farm. Okay, um, these are vital. These are vital, particularly for Irish farmers. All right, for farmers around all of Europe. Um, so there's nine main objectives. So apart from just improving productivity, there's nine main objectives of the cap. One is to ensure a fair income. So to ensure farmers basically get a fair income for their produce, increase competitiveness so that like, you know, competition's good. If, if there's someone that's competing this, alongside you, it'll strive you to be better. Um, rebalance the power in the food chain. Climate change, action, a big thing. So a big thing is like, if you're going to be like to, to get access to some of the money from the common agricultural policy, Farmers have to meet certain targets when it comes to emissions on their farms. Uh, environmental care, again, like, for example, there are certain laws like, you know, you can't cut hedges at a certain time of year on farms because hedges act as natural habitats for birds and stuff. Um, again, preserve landscapes and biodiversity. This kind of fits under the thing I just mentioned. Um, support renewal, general, generational renewal, sorry. Again, so this means, you know, like supporting the process of handing a farm down to a son or a daughter after the, the, the you know parent has retired um create vibrant rural areas so again like you know creating a, a rural area that is is economically strong and that people want to live in through farming and again protect food health and quality so just maintain standards of food quality so like you know for example irish agricultural produce particularly our beef is a very high quality and we would be probably ahead of many other european countries and um, when it comes to food health and quality okay so that's a common agricultural policy and um, again improves productivity and ensures a stable supply of food for all eu member states so um another way the eu would promote international cooperation well just the treaty of rome in 1957 brought six countries into the eu this cooperation will be increased through the enlargement of the eu or the EEC as it was known in the year 1973. Okay, so new countries would join in 1973, Ireland being one of them. Okay, some of these countries that joined in 73 to include the, the six members that were already there were Denmark, Ireland, and the UK. All right, so this, you know, this shows the strength of the EU that a few years later, more countries wanted to join. Okay, because we could see the positives of being in the European Union. And this came at a time that was vital for Ireland. Okay, Ireland really, really needed to, I suppose, broaden its horizons and join the European economic community. Okay. The fourth way international cooperation was promoted was through the Single European Act. And the Single European Act, basically, it kind of does what it says on the tin. So it basically, treats all of Europe as a single state, okay? And it was signed in 1987, and what it did is remove the remaining trade barriers. So we mentioned how, you, how the European Union has a common market. Um, there, were, there were still some small trade barriers up until 1987 when a single European Act was signed, and this removed the remaining trade barriers, okay? It kind of, again, turned the European Union into like a single state, um, so like, stuff could now move even easier and even free more free through uh, across each member state so this was a very very significant way of promoting international cooperation so another way international cooperation was promoted was by signing this treaty and this treaty was probably one of the most significant pieces of documents or legislation in the history of the european union and this was called the Maastricht Treaty, and it was signed in the year 1991. Okay, um, now what did it do? Well, it meant that the European Parliament had a greater power in how its member states were run. So Europe had its own parliament. So every country in Europe would have its own parliament, but Europe also has a parliament that deals with affairs within the European Union. So affairs to do with unity and cooperation within the European Union. And 
for the European Union to work effectively, it, it's, its parliament had to have a bit more say in its member states. So that was one of the, the, the I suppose, deals in the Maastricht Treaty. The second thing it did, the Maastricht Treaty, was it set out plans for a euro currency. So the currency we use today is the euro. Now, you're probably too young to remember this, but I can remember when the euro was first brought in. Okay, now not back in 91, it wasn't brought in until the late 90s, early noughties, but the initial plans for the euro were set out in the Maastricht Treaty. Okay, and again, the euro currency was going to be a currency that all member states had to use. The Maastricht Treaty also made people in member states official citizens of Europe. So if you're born in Ireland and you've got an Irish passport, you're also not only an Irish citizen, but you are a European citizen. And there's lots of benefits to that. It means you can move, travel freely around Europe and kind of settle in any country without the need for a, a visa application or anything, okay? Because you're a European citizen. The Maastricht Treaty, because I suppose countries, you're, you're now able to move freer between countries, one negative impact of this is criminals. Criminals can move freely across borders in Europe. So that meant the police forces had to cooperate more. So police forces in each member state could cooperate better under the Maastricht Treaty. Okay, this Maastricht Treaty also officially changed the name of the EEC to the European Union. So again, the EEC, the European Economic Community, was now rebranded the European Union. It was kind of seen as a more modern, slicker name, I guess. And that's where that comes from. So the Maastricht Treaty was probably one of the biggest pieces of legislation in promoting international cooperation in the EU. Another major, major way international cooperation was promoted in the EU was the euro currency. Okay, now have a think. The euro currency, how could this promote cooperation? Well, it's, it's very obvious. No matter what EU country you go to, your money will work there. OK, you probably wonder why, like, that's why certain coins, if you look at certain coins, some coins might, if, if they've got the harp on them, they're Irish. Some euro coins might have, might, might say they'd be Spanish or German, etc. So certain, um, certain, all European countries have their own version of the euro currency, but it's all the same. OK, a 10, 10 euro note in Spain is the same as it is in Ireland, in Germany, etc. And the euro currency was officially brought in in 99 and it meant that now all EU member states had the same currency. And again, this just, it helped to promote trade, it helped to pro promote trade and it brought stability to Europe. So that was a big thing, it brought stability. You see, the problem is, is different currencies kind of can outperform each other. For example, the dollar can outperform the euro or the pound can outperform the dollar. Okay. And this is not really a good thing. So in Europe, they decided every country has the same currency. So we're, that meant it just promoted more stability between each country. So like Germany can't say, oh, our currency is doing way better than the French, the French currency. OK, because it's all the same. OK, now the only one negative impact of it is, is sometimes if certain countries go through economic hardship, for example, Greece went through economic hardship and um, their economy declined probably to the lowest of any European country, and they were using the euro, and because of that, the entire value of the euro dropped. But on a whole, it is considered a positive thing, okay? Um, the European Parliament as well, the European Parliament meets once a month in Brussels or Strasbourg, and again, that's another way of just promoting um, cooperation, and every, every country in the European Union would have, they're called MEPs, members of European Parliament, who would go and represent us in, um, in in Europe, in European affairs. So we also need to look at how the European Union not only promotes cooperation, which you've already done, we must understand how the European Union promotes human rights and how the European Union promotes justice. Okay. Um, and one of the main, the, the human rights was officially brought into the legislation of the EU in the year 2000 through the Charter of Fundamental Human Rights. And this officially promotes justice and human rights in the EU. Okay, 
So it's part of EU legislation. So human rights must be treated fairly and equally across all European member states. And we're going to look at what's in this charter now. A lot of stuff in this charter will be, you know, basic enough stuff that you've probably all seen or heard of before. So as a European citizen, what are my fundamental rights? Well, you have the right to equality. Okay, so that's the right to equality, regardless of your ethnicity, religion, gender, political views. You have the right to be treated equally in society as everyone. And when I say equally, I mean equal in terms of the same access to health care, education, work, leisure as anybody else. OK, you have the right to freedom. So you have the right to be free, free from any kind of suppression. OK, whether it's government suppression. OK, whether it is suppression from um any are there any extremist group in a country you have the right to freedom okay the right against exploitation so the right again the right the right not to be exploited whether it's in the workforce etc okay again the right to freedom of religion so the right to you have the right to practice your religion once you're not basically endangering anybody else you have the right to practice your religion freely you have the right to culture and education so the right to education is a big thing um a very a, a basic thing but something that a lot of us take for granted um but it's very very important and it's a fundamental right in the eu okay and we're very lucky there's many countries throughout the world where certain people in society have don't have these rights for example afghanistan we know since the you know taliban takeover of, of afghanistan women w- would not have most of these rights they would not have a lot of these rights here because of because of, of their gender so it's it's really really sad in that way Okay, um, very good. So these are the fundamental rights of the EU as laid down by the, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. Okay, so a little brief, I suppose, case study we'll look at here is how the EU has dealt with refugees. Okay, so a refugee is someone who's fleeing their country, they're fleeing from either war or political persecution or terrorism. Okay, and the EU has had to deal with a number of refugee crises, okay? So we've had the Syrian refugee crisis due to the Syrian civil war. And recently, you know, in 2022, we've had the refugee crisis as a result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Okay, so the EU has like special directives and plans that it, it can activate and put in place to deal with refugees. Like, you know, you have to have plans in place for this because there could be millions of people leaving a country in, in, in the space of a number of months, fleeing war, and they're coming into Europe. So we need to have special plans in place to house these people and look after them. So in March 22, the EU activated the Temporary Protection Directive. So March 22, following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Temporary Protection Directive was brought in. Okay, and this was an, an, an EU emergency scheme to deal with refugees. So again, a, a major way the European Union deals with human rights, okay? And there is a number of things in this de- directive. The first thing is that it provided immediate and collective protection to displaced persons. So displaced people who had lost their home or fled their home coming into the European Union were given immediate and collective protection, okay? And again, it also aimed to reduce the pressure on the national asylum systems of EU countries. All right. So the idea behind it is that every EU country has to take in refugees and you take in the amount that you can basically hold or accommodate. OK, because you think about geography is about to do with this. Like if, if you know, countries are fleeing from, say, if, if people are fleeing from Ukraine, the chances are the first country to go to is Poland because it's geographically next door to them and it's an EU country. So the idea behind this is that not everyone just goes to the nearest country to flee to you know the, the, the nearest country that they that they flee to you're, you're you're you'll be put into countries that can accommodate you okay um and under the eu temporary protection directive it gives temporary protection and this includes a residence permit so you get a permit to say you're a resident of for example ireland okay and um, you've access to labor market so it means that you're given a work permit so you're basically given a permit where you can work 
you know, that, that's hugely important to be able to work because if you can work, it means you can sustain yourself in that country. And it means you're not going to be as much of a burden on that country either because you can work and make your own wage and contribute to society. Um, you can get access to housing, you can get medical assistance and your children have the right to education. So you might have seen this yourself in school. There may be some Ukrainian students who may have joined your year or class group. Um, and the reason why they can join your school, thankfully, is thanks to the EU Temporary Protection Directive, which grants them the right to education. So, as well as human rights, we also have the European Court of Justice. And the European Court of Justice looks after law in the European Union. Okay. And basically, like this is this is important. You know, it's quite important that law is upheld throughout the European Union. Like the European Union, you know, does common markets, everyone can travel and move freely. So that means that laws must be reasonably similar. Okay. All these countries they have the same currency. Um so you know, a lot, a lot of things about the countries are kind of more uniform and the same because they're in the European Union, and law is one of them. Okay, um, so it was it was established in fifty two for dealing with law in the EU, and the Court of Justice ensures that EU law is enforced the same way across member states. So, but laws set down by the European Union must be the same across all member states. They can't be different. So the Germans can't be enforcing one law in a different manner to the French or the Belgians or the Spanish. It must be the same and, I suppose, yeah, the same and consistent across all EU member states. Now, we're going to look at, a, at, at one very good Irish example of how the EU made sure that, law, that the law was enforced in the, in the same way across member states. So... The example of this I'm going to talk about is the David Norris case. Okay, you may have heard of David Norris. He is an Irish senator. That's it is to this day. Okay, now we know Ireland was a country that I suppose lived under the grip of the Catholic Church for a long time. So, for example, things like divorce was illegal, homosexuality was illegal, and homosexuality is what we're going to talk about now. So, in Ireland, homosexuality had been illegal for centuries. OK. And this man here, David Norris, said he, he wanted to challenge this. He believed it was wrong. So Senator David Norris challenged this in 1977 as one of the founding members of the Campaign for Homosexual Law Reform. OK. And Norris basically found a loophole in the UN Convention of Human Rights that he believed he could use to basically outlaw or outlaw the, or get rid of the law against homosexuality in Ireland. So Norris believed that criminalizing homosexual acts in Ireland was in breach of the right to private life. That's very important. The European Convention of Human Rights stated that everyone has the right to private life. Okay, so if you're a homosexual person, you have the right to practice your sexuality, I suppose, in private. Okay. Even, you know, because it was illegal in Ireland, but the European Court of Human Rights stated that you could practice basically and do whatever you want in private in the comfort of your own home. OK, and this is where Norris decided to challenge Ireland. He, he, he believed that, OK, I can challenge the law on homosexuality in Ireland through this convention that's in the EU Convention of Human Rights. So Norris took his case to the Irish Supreme Court and unfortunately, he eventually lost his case in the Irish Supreme Court in 1983. But this didn't stop him. Okay, so we know he found one of the laws in the European Court of Human Rights was that you had the right to do anything you want basically in private. Okay, so in 1988, Norris appealed to the European Court of Human Rights. The court found in his favour of Norris, okay, and gave people the right to engage in same sexual activity in private. Okay, so very, very, I suppose, clever work by Norris. Ireland at this point was in the EU, but homosexuality was still illegal. Okay, Norris found a, you know, found a, an article or a law in the EU Court of Human Rights and decided to use this to challenge 
to challenge the Irish law, okay, that it is okay to engage in same sexual activity in private. And this challenge would eventually pave the way for the decriminalization of same sex activity in Ireland in 93. So basically, homosexual activity was decriminalized in Ireland. It was no longer illegal to be homosexual in Ireland. Okay, and much of that is down to not only David Norris, okay, so obviously fantastic campaigning on his part, but Irish membership in the e in the European Union. So membership in the European Union, one of the things that the European Union promotes is equality. So if you're to be an EU member state, you must be an equal nation and promote equality among your members. So folks, now we're going to look at more in detail at Ireland and the European Union. Okay. So Ireland, the EEC, well, we know all the benefits of joining the EEC, the cap, the common markets, the removal of trade barriers, the euro currency. Um, but why specifically did Ireland join the EEC? What was Ireland like in the mid 20th century that joining the EEC would be a big benefit? Well, at the time, Ireland's economy was very much an agriculture based economy. And the only really country we trade with was Britain. They were our only trading partner. And economically, we were very weak. So again, that was the one huge reason. Joining the EEC would give Ireland access to EU markets, okay? And it meant that we would not completely rely on Britain. So we could now trade with many countries. We could buy stuff from Spain. We could sell stuff to France, okay? We know Ireland was a very agricultural society, okay? And the common agricultural policy, okay, would benefit Ireland's many farmers. So that the CAP, C-A-P, common agricultural policy, would be vital for Irish farmers. Ireland was a country at this time that basically had very few industries, okay, very few. So the idea was it would possibly attract foreign companies to set up in Ireland. Okay, so if Ireland is an EU an EU member, um, EU companies or American companies could establish themselves in Ireland easily, and this would, without a doubt, lead to the creation of more jobs in Ireland. So loads and loads of benefits to Ireland joining the EEC, or the EU as we, we we later know it as, and this is vital, guys. This is vital for Ireland, and it's a huge reason why, uh, you know, the EEC basically has been huge for Ireland, and we're going to look at this now. So, Ireland joins the EEC in 1973. But how has this benefited us? Well, it's benefited us hugely in many, many ways. So, firstly, Irish people gained EU citizenship, okay? So if you're an Irish passport holder, you're a resident, you're, you're a citizen of Ireland, you're also a citizen of Europe. This means you can live and work freely in any member state. So as an Irish person, when you leave school, you might say, I want to travel and you can go and live and work in any EU member state. No problem whatsoever. OK. Ireland joined the EU single market or common market. That's how you know, we call it a single market or common market. And again, this makes it easy for Irish businesses to trade in Europe. So Irish products, whether they're industrial items or agricultural produce, can be sold throughout Europe and vice versa. So like when you go to the supermarket next time, if you buy some fruit or veg in particular, pick it up and look at the back of the packet. Good chance it came from the European Union. OK, and um, EU membership has attracted foreign businesses to Ireland. So like Ireland, this is huge for Ireland. Loads of foreign businesses are based here. Loads of big companies have their their European headquarters in Ireland. TikTok, um, they're based in Ireland. Apple have the European headquarters in Ireland. Facebook are based in Ireland. OK, so a lot of huge companies are based in Ireland. Um, and again, because we're in the European Union and because Ireland actually has quite a low tax rate as well. OK, um, it is estimated that about 700,000 jobs have been created in Ireland since joining the EU. 700,000, so almost 1 million jobs. And this number will hopefully keep on rising with further investment. That's a huge, huge, huge amount of jobs created in the last few decades. And again, thanks to EU membership. 
the more companies etc that set up in ireland the more i suppose jobs as a knock-on effect are going to be created how else has ireland benefited from the eu well Irish farmers receive 1.2 billion euro of funding each year through the Common Agricultural Policy. So if any of you are from a farming background, ask your parents about the Common Agricultural Policy. I guarantee you they'll speak very highly of it, okay, because they're, it gives them grants. They get grants, they get some money for that to help support themselves as farmers, okay. As well as farming, fishing also benefits. So Ireland we know Ireland is a small island nation surrounded by great waters for fishing. So the Irish fishing industry receives EU funding each year. Okay, um, an example of this would be in County Donegal, the harbour in Killy Bags in County Donegal has received lots and lots of funding and that has allowed the fishing harbour there to really expand and grow. Okay, um, EU membership has supported the peace process in Northern Ireland. So. When you do the troubles topic, guys, you'll you'll have looked at, at the you know the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. Um, EU membership has has helped to benefit that. Okay, so you know we know one of the things in EU, in the in, in the European Union is they want to promote promote international cooperation, um, and end violence. Okay, so they would have played a big part in trying to support the peace process up north. EU, EU legislation makes it easier and cheaper to travel to other member states. So, like, if, if you've ever been on holiday to any European country or travel there, like, it's quite, an e it's quite easy. You just rock up to the airport with your passport and it's very straightforward. That's because of EU membership. In other countries, for example, if you go to America, you know, you have to go through American pre-clearance. It's like their version of border control. And, you, you know, they ask you a lot of, you know, fairly, I suppose stringent questions okay um because they just they just have a tough a tough immigration policy whereas if you're in the european union you're a european citizen and you can travel easily um without you know w without the hassle of going through you know a, a kind of a being questioned on the motives behind your journey okay um another actually big benefit we can say for the eu is eu structural funds so eu structural funds is a big thing You'll notice if you go onto any major roadways or motorways in Ireland, a lot of time you'll see a, a, a European Union flag. So a lot of the infrastructure in Ireland was built with the help of EU structural funds. Okay, so a lot of European countries are the same. They'll have really good motorways and stuff because the European Union helps to build those. Okay, again, it just makes the country more connected and more, I suppose, economically strong. The final way in which Ireland has benefited the EU is equality, okay? So Ireland was not an equal society when we joined the EU. Women were kind of treated as second-class citizens in a way in kind of the mid-20th century. We know like contraception was illegal. We know that things like divorce were illegal. Women were paid less in the workplace. Homosexuality was illegal. So one of the things about joining the EU is, think back to our Charter of Fundamental Human Rights. OK, um, equality was a big thing. If you're in the European Union, you must promote equality. So Irish women were discriminated against when it came to work back in the 1970s. But this would change. OK, um, one of the things actually in the 70s was, was the marriage bar. So the marriage bar was very harsh. It meant that when a woman got married and had kids, she had to give up her job, basically. OK, um, but all this was abolished eventually when Ireland joined the EU. So European legislation has ensured that Irish men and women are entitled to equal pay for doing the same job. Okay, very, very important. They also have legal protection when it comes to equal and fair treatment at work. Okay, that's a huge thing. So women were not treated and paid equally like men were. Okay. Um, both women and men are entitled to maternity and paternity leave under an EU directive as well. Okay, so it, it made big steps in equality in Ireland. Okay, equality in gender, equality in the workforce, um, as a result of EU membership. Okay, 
Okay, folks, thanks a million for tuning in to this Saturday session of Junior Cycle History here at examrevision.ie. I hope it was beneficial. We'll see you in our next session.